In this lesson, we're going to continue to talk about state space modeling with a focus on how to fit state space models in the presence of missing data and how to introduce covariates into these models uh, to create some dynamic regression models. And we're going to start where we left off last time, having fit a random walk uh, state space model to our data and then made some forecasts from it that were not very good. They missed the flu season and had really large uncertainty. And so in order to start, you'll need to have uh, run the code that we uh, created and ran during the last tutorial. Now, as we saw at the end of the last video, we can add NAs to the end of the time series, and doing that produces forecasts from these Bayesian state space models that we've been working with. And this happens because the model attempts to determine the most likely value for each of those Y values represented by an NA, based on the model and the data as part of the fitting process. And what this means is that this type of modeling approach also works naturally with missing data. And this is different from some of the other techniques we've learned in this course that require continuously sampled time series. And that's handy because a lot of ecological time series have gaps in them. To illustrate how this works, we'll add some NAs to the portion of our time series that's used as training data as an example of what missing data would look like. So to do this, let's go back up in our code uh, to that line where we uh, added the NAs or where we replaced the end of our time series with NAs. It should be around line 39 or so. And we're going to use two different examples for two different kinds of missing data. First, we'll just create some missing data in a few random weeks where data just wasn't collected in some reason or, or got lost. And so we'll say data dollar sign Y. So again, we're going to go into that data object that has all of the information that gets passed to JAGS. We're going to access the outcome of the model, our Y, our predicted level of searches in, in the Google Flu data set. And then we'll use the square brackets to specify which values to replace with NAs. And in here, we'll put a vector and then we'll just pick some positions along the time series to make null. And I'll choose 26, 50, 90, 260, 261, and 262. So it's the 26th week in the time series, the 50th week in the time series, and so on. And we'll set those equal to NA. So these are just little bits of missing data. And then we'll run that line of code. And then the other thing that we're going to do is simulate an entire year's worth of missing data. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go back up to the top and load one more library, uh, one more package, which is the Lubridate package we've used a couple of times before. And I'll come back down here. And now we're going to throw out an entire year's worth of data. And so we'll say data dollar sign y square brackets. So again, we're going to take part of this vector y and set it equal to NAs. And then we're going to use the year function from Lubridate. That's going to extract just the year from a date. And if you'll remember up at the top, we created uh, this time vector which was a date coming from the Google flu data. And we just want to grab the year part of that. 
And so to do that, we say year of the date formatted vector. And so that's time. And we're going to say that's equal to, let's say, 2008. For some reason, we lost all the flu data for 2008. And we'll set that equal to NA as well. And now we're going to rerun all of the modeling and prediction steps we learned about last time. Uh, We'll go ahead and recreate this initialization. It's going to change a little bit because we now have null values and y. We'll then uh, create our model using jags.model. We'll then take our first 10,000 samples from jags out. I'm going to skip over uh, plotting the, the summaries. They should look pretty good. And then we'll go ahead and do our full sample after the burn-in. We'll extract the output into a matrix. And then we're going to get rid of the information on uh, the variance parameters and just keep the x's. And remember that our x's here are actually our y values, our observations, because uh, we changed that part way through. And then we'll go ahead and get our predictions, our point estimates as the average of all of those samples, uh, one sample for each step uh, in the fitting process. And what we can see so far is that everything seems to have just worked. We added in some missing data, the model still ran, it apparently produced predictions, and with a lot of time series models, we wouldn't have even gotten this far because those models require continuously sampled data. So now let's go ahead and look at what the output looks like. Uh, I'm gonna hop down here and run X11, which will just automatically plot in an external window which we need since I'm zoomed in for teaching. Uh, and now we're just going to replot the exact same visualization that we made at the end of last time, uh, only I've made a couple of minor tweaks to make it easier for us to see. And so we're going to plot our predictions uh, as points and lines, as well as our empirical data, and then also the uncertainty estimates for those predictions. And so here's something that looks a lot like the graph that we originally made. Uh, the predictions over here, the forecasts, generally look uh, about the same, uh, flat at the bottom, uh, very large prediction intervals. But we can also see something else going on in this graph which is that the model has made estimates for what the missing values are along with some associated uncertainty. And this is called data imputation. So if we look over here uh, towards the beginning of the time series, for these single or small number of missing values, we can see that the predictions are consistent with where the data is and they have relatively small uh, amounts of uncertainty around them. And so the model's pretty confident about what should have been going on uh, for those null values. But when we come over here to 2008, where we're missing the entire year of empirical data in our fitting, the model actually has much more similar behavior to what we saw for our forecasts. The model predicts very little in the way of change over time. It's basically flat. And there's large amounts of uncertainty uh, about what the values should be uh, in this region. And it's interesting to note that that uncertainty peaks in the middle of this missing year. So it's relatively low, one time step, uh, before 2008 and one time step before the end of 2008, uh, but quite high in the middle. And that's because this is where there's the least empirical information available to constrain 
the predictions. And so towards the beginning, there's the empirical data from 2007 to help constrain the model. Towards the end, there's the empirical information from 2009 to help constrain the model. But in the middle, there's very little information. And so the model says, eh, I'm not sure. And so this shows us that this imputation is capturing the model's uncertainty within our training data when there are no observed values available to constrain the estimates of that latent variable x that we learned about last time. And that uncertainty without observed values to constrain the latent variable is quite high. And that's why the forecasts from our models are highly uncertain because we don't have any observations out here to constrain the model. All right, so we've got a forecasting method that lets us do cool things with uncertainties and works with missing data, but it's not exactly giving us a useful forecast yet. So what went wrong? What are we missing in our model that we need to think about to make things better? And let's start by exploring a little bit more about where things went wrong by using some of the graphical evaluation tools uh, that we've learned about previously. And we've already plotted our observed and predicted time series against one another, and that was useful. Uh, but let's go ahead and evaluate the model in another way that we learned and look at how the error in the point forecasts changes with the forecast horizon. Remember, in general, the farther out into the future we're trying to forecast, the worse the forecast tends to be. And to do this, we're going to first need to identify the piece of the data that we actually made the forecast on. Because unlike before, our whole time series has predictions and observed values in this case. And so we'll call this the forecast window. And we're going to set that equal to the same vector that we used to choose the end of the time series to make null uh, when we, we created those null values to allow the forecasts. And to do that, we're going to do parentheses length of y minus 51. And then we're going to go outside of those parentheses, colon, length of y. And so what this is going to do is it's going to identify just the end of the time series, the last 52 weeks. And now what we're going to do is for those last 52 weeks, we will plot the root mean squared error as a function of how far forward in time we're trying to forecast. And so this is the same plot we made a few weeks ago. On the x-axis, we'll include our time variable, which is time in this case. Since we're starting at, at forecast time equals 1, uh, this will work in place of a technical forecast horizon. And then square brackets and uh, forecast window. So that's going to give us just this end of the time series. And then the other thing we need to plot is the root mean squared error. So how far away from the predictions were the point estimates on average? We can leave out the average part here because we only have one forecast for each of those time steps. And we'll so, so we'll say square root, parenthesis, parenthesis, predictions. So this is our predicted value. Uh, and again, we want that in the forecast window. So square brackets, forecast window. And then minus our observations, which are in Y, square brackets, forecast window. And then go outside of that set of parentheses and then squared. And I'm also going to uh, make these points a little bit bigger so that we can see them. 
LWD is equal to five. And now we can plot this. And so what we can see here is that our random walk model worked quite well for the first time step, uh, but then got gradually worse as our forecasts got farther into the future, at least for a while. And what's quite interesting here is that normally we'd expect this air to just keep going up, but it doesn't. It actually starts to come back down again uh, starting in January, and eventually falls pretty much back down to zero by the end of our forecasts. And that's because this increase in error represents that flu season that we missed. And once the flu season is over, the flu rates start to return to those baseline levels, which is basically what our model captured was that sort of baseline bottom level of flu. And so the air declines to near zero again. And this kind of pattern is actually can be diagnostic for uh, something that's missing in the model, which is some sort of seasonal component or a cyclic predictor variable that we haven't managed to include in the model. And in the past, we've modeled this kind of cyclic pattern using seasonal lags. There are two other ways to also go about modeling them. First, we could include date somehow as a predictor. Or second, we could try to identify the drivers of the cyclic pattern and include those as predictors in our model. And so both of these approaches require adding covariates to our time series models, either something representing date or some sort of environmental or other driver. And we describe models like this that include both a time series component and some sort of predictor variable as dynamic regression models. And if those regressions are linear, we describe them as dynamic linear models. So let's take a look at what these look like. We're going to start by getting some weather data. Uh, you'll need the Daymeter package installed. I'm going to come back up here to the top and load that package. Daymet R. And then we'll go ahead and download some weather data. I'll call this weather and we'll set it equal to uh, the output from the download underscore daymet function. And we need to provide this function information on where we want to get weather data for and when we want to get it for. And so uh, I'll say site is equal to Orlando. We're working with Florida data, so this is a reasonable starting point, uh, which has a latitude, lat is equal to 28.54, a longitude or LON is equal to minus 81.34. It's like I forgot a comma there. And then we need the start and end dates to get data for. And so we'll say start in 2003, because that's how far our data goes back. And end equals 2016, because that's when our data ends. And we need one more optional argument, which is internal is equal to true. And that'll download the daymet data for this particular lat-long combination, and this set of years. And we can then uh, grab the actual piece of that out that we need uh, by saying weather underscore data is equal to weather 
dollar sign data because there's a bunch of other metadata and stuff in here that we don't need to, to talk about or work with for our example today. Now, if we look at weather data, what we'll see is we have two pieces of information on the date. We've got uh, the year and we've got Y day, which is the day of the year, uh, or the Julian day, which we've talked about before. So one is January 1, two is January 2nd, three is January 3rd, and so on, all the way up to 365 or 366. And then we have uh, a bunch of information on temperatures and other things, including the minimum and maximum temperatures. We need to now combine this temperature data, which is daily, with our flu data, which is weekly. And so to do that, we need to turn our date information here into an actual date. And so we'll do that uh, by saying that our weather data, uh, and we're going to add a new column called date, so dollar sign $date, is equal to as dot date. This is how we create date data. And then we're going to have to uh, force this data to look like a date so that we can convert it into one. And so we'll do that using the paste function. And that's going to let us stick two pieces of text together. And the first piece of text is our year. And so we'll say weather data dollar sign year. And our second piece of text is that Julian day. So weather data dollar sign Y day. And we're going to paste these together using a separator, which is a dash. And so we'll say sep is equal to quotes hyphen. So that's going to create the thing that as.date will know how to process. And then if you remember, we have to tell as.date what format this date data is in. And so for us, this goes in a string. It's the four digit year, so percent capital Y. We've then separated those four digit years from our Julian days with a dash. And so we'll put a dash. And then percent %j indicates Julian day. And so if we go back to weather data, we'll now see uh, that the last column is a date. And so we'll be able to use that to combine this uh, with our other data. And so we'll set weather data equal to a subset of weather data where the date column, so weather data at date is percent in percent, so where that date is in our time vector. So if we have the day in our weekly Google flu data, then we'll keep the weather data for that day. So now we need to add any information that we want from this weather data table into our data object that we're using to fit models. And so we'll say data at T min, we'll try minimum temperature as our predictor, is equal to weather underscore data at T min, and then hit tab, because this is kind of a oddly uh, named variable. It's T min dot dot deg dot c dot. 
and we'll run that. And then we also, let's go ahead and grab that Julian day as well in case it's useful for prediction. And so we'll say data at y day is equal to weather underscore data dollar sign y day. And so now we've basically added two new time series of potential predictor variables to our data object that we've been passing to JAGS for our state space modeling. And then I'm going to make one more change to our data object, which is to create a log transformed version of our Y data, of our observed data, uh, because as this model gets more complicated, uh, transforming Y will help these methods that search around for parameter values converge. And so we'll say data dollar sign log of Y or log Y is equal to log of data at Y. Okay, so that was a lot of work uh, before we can look at the modeling, but we're done and we have our data all ready to go. Now, we can absolutely incorporate predictors into uh, this kind of JAGS model uh, that we've written before. It gets increasingly complicated the more things that we're putting into a model. And so to limit the amount of time that we spend on this today, uh, we're going to leverage a package that will basically write this model for us uh, and then run it as well. And this package is called Eco Forecast R. Uh, it's written by Mike Dietz's group uh, to help facilitate teaching this sort of thing. And so if you haven't installed it already, you'll need to do that now. There's instructions on the materials page because it's a little different than a normal package. Uh, and I'm going to go up here and go ahead and load Eco Forecast. R, and then we'll come back down to the bottom of our script. So let's start by building the same basic type of model that we built last time, but adding the minimum temperature as a predictor. And so we'll call this DLM for dynamic linear model, and we fit these using this package using the fit underscore DLM function. And it takes two key arguments. The first is the model. And we specify this model as a named list. So we'll say list. And then we've got two key pieces of information here. The first is the observations. So that's OBS is equal to, and then in quotes, the name of the variable that we're using for those observations. And so that's log Y. And that has to be in that data object that we created last time. And then the second thing that goes in this list is the fixed effects model. And so we'll call this fixed. You can also add random if you have random effects. And then we specify this model using fairly standard R model terminology. And so we'll say tilde one, that's going to give us an intercept, plus x. And x here is our latent variable that we talked about last time. So our y is a function of that latent variable x plus the minimum temperature, which we've called t min. And then we also need to give it the data that it's going to work with. And in our case, that's just data. And so this is going to fit a state space model 
where log y is the response variable. There's the standard one time step autocorrelation uh, within the process model for the latent variable x. The response variable will be modeled as a function of the latent variable, just like we learned about last time. Uh, but also, x will be a function of this minimum temperature as well. And so let's go ahead and run that. We can see some of the same kind of behavior that we saw from JAGS last time. And in fact, this is just running JAGS just like we did last week. It's just uh, running it for us. And we can see that this just wrote a JAGS model for us uh, by typing cat parentheses and then DLM dollar sign model. And so if I actually run this, what it will show us is the model that was generated by the Eco Forecast R package and sent to JAGS. And so the priors look just like the ones we wrote. There are no random effects here. That's why it's all commented out. We've then got some setup for our fixed effects models, and this is where things get a little more complicated and, and why we're not doing it ourselves today. And then we see uh, our data and our process models, which look similar to what we've already done. So our observation is a normally distributed uh, outcome with a mean of our latent variable, and some variance. There's some additional uh, complexity here. And then we can see that our process model says that our latent variable at time t is a function of our latent variable at time t minus one, plus a version of that with a coefficient now. So like we would have uh, using an ARIMA model, but we didn't do last time, plus an intercept plus uh, some coefficient on the minimum temperature. And so now we can visualize our forecasts in a way similar to what we've done before. So uh, I'll create uh, some output, which will hold the matrix version of our predictions. So that's as dot matrix DLM dollar sign predict because that's where those predictions are held is in the predict object we'll then calculate our prediction interval so we'll call this pred interval and we do that using the apply function we need to do something slightly different than last time because we modeled log of y, and so we need to get these back to being actual y's, and so we'll say exp of our output. That's what we're going to uh, apply this quantile function to like we did last time. So we're gonna apply the quantile function to each column. So two for columns, quantile is the function that we wanna apply and then as a vector, the quantiles that we want to get out. And last time we did 0.025 and 0.975. I'm also going to grab 0.5 while I'm here because that's the same as the mean. And so we'll just grab it all at once instead of using uh, call means like we did before. And then we can go ahead and plot things. So we'll plot time on the x, our observed values y on the y, and we'll set our line width to five so that we can see things. 
I'm going to go ahead and create a window here to look at this in. Uh, we'll then go ahead and add our predicted values from the model. And so we'll add lines with time on the x, our prediction interval in the second position, because that's going to be that 50% quantile on the y. And again, we'll set uh, our line width equal to 5. And then we can add our prediction interval itself as well. Uh, and so like last time we had lines, time on the x, our lower bound on the y. So that's our prediction interval, uh, the first set of values. We'll set line width equal to 5, color equal to blue, and line type equal to dotted. Then I'm going to copy this line and add it again after I give myself just a touch more space. And we'll use three because that's our upper bound position. And apparently I messed something up, so we'll create our plotting window again and then just run all of this plotting code together. And so here's our new model with temperature in there as a covariate. It's better, but it's not great. We at least see some up and down in this predicted window, but it's shifted off from flu season. And it's not super good, but we've managed to include an external predictor here. So that's kind of exciting. Let's try adding the Julian day in directly and seeing if it can pick things up here for us. So let's just go back up to where we fit our digital linear model and add one more covariate, which is our Y day data. And now I'll just rerun the code from here on down. Going to take just a little longer to fit because it's thinking about more stuff. And now this is a much more encouraging model. If we look out here in our forecasts, that Julian Day, this sort of generic seasonal information, uh, has captured a lot of what's going on. It doesn't get up quite to the spike of this flu season, but it's a bit abnormal. Uh, but we see this nice spike. Uh, the high point is directly coincident with the actual peak of flu season. And then it drops off. And now our prediction intervals include all of the data as well, except maybe this point, and we'd want to miss about one point with a prediction interval like this, between zero and one points. Uh, and so that's uh, pretty encouraging. And we look like we've actually got a pretty nice forecast for the flu. But I will warn you that it's a little bit more complicated uh, than this when implementing Julian Day as a predictor uh, in most cases. And that's because Julian Day is what we would call a circular variable. And the idea is that we know that December 31st and January 1st are right next to each other. But if we model Julian Day directly like this, December 31st and January 1st are actually as far apart as you can get. And so uh, we have to do special transformations, harmonic transformations of the Julian day for this to work properly in most circumstances. But in this case, we got lucky because of when uh, 
uh, the timing of the peak and seasonal flu season is. I'm not going to show this, show you how to do this though, because that's a subject for another lesson. Uh, and so we'll just stop here with this as an example that suggests that we should be able to do a pretty decent job of being able to forecast at least the timing of the peaks of influenza season. And so this looks better, but they're not exactly fuzzy caterpillar-like. Uh, the different colors are three different chains, so the model has fit three different times, uh, and they're still... Maybe I should just forget about this part. Yes, yes I should. Excellent.